Thursday afternoon, December the 29th, 1977. Midwinter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wynn Worley is the speaker of the afternoon. Now this afternoon, I haven't said anything about this because this is not a book selling tour or anything, but if you haven't seen these two books, this contains nearly everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> this old black, this is the red face book we call it. Uh, you may have seen it with a blue cover because New Leaf has started pushing it across the country and it's got a dark blue cover, but the insides are the same. Now they printed it on cheaper paper so it looks thicker, but uh, it's the same book because they photograph from my book plates. But uh, Battling the Host of Hell, and this is the sequel, Conquering the Host of Hell. Uh, the camp has them here, and uh, we would encourage you to get these books and study them. The biggest complaint that we've had is, especially on this one, they say I picked up that stupid book and I couldn't stop reading it. I kept saying I got to go to bed and I'll read just two more pages and then I just kept going. <laughs> so that's a pretty good complaint, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And um, one lady, I went to a meeting someplace, I don't remember, and she said I got to hold that black book and said, my lands, I started reading and the next thing you know I got deathly sick. I ran into the bathroom and threw up. I came back, started reading again. I had to run to the bathroom, so I kept running back and forth, back and forth. And so the Holy Spirit has really anointed the truth that's in here. Now, it isn't Win Worley's truth. This is simply what the Bible says. This book is being used, thank God, to convince people that Christians can have demons. There have been preachers convinced this. They pulled their Greek and Hebrew out and started running references. And they said, good Lord, he's right. And that's pretty good, isn't it? Now, I'm not smart enough to do that. The Lord did that. And I don't take any credit for it. I put the things together, wrote down what had happened. And, of course, I had some help from those smart other kids in my church bringing me all these nifty little things that I had never seen, but I would have thought of it if I had taken time. <laughs> but, uh, but seriously, the, this book is, and these two books are full of gleanings of the truth that we've found in deliverance. It's not the whole thing. It's not comprehensive at all. It's just a gathering together of many things that help you understand what is happening in the spiritual conflict. And a lot of the things are just starters. They're just teasers. I put enough about the spirits of God in there to make your brain wheel start spinning if you got any that will spin and get the rust off of them and send you to your concordances and start whopping the daylights out of the devil. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in this ministry, I would encourage you to get these books and peruse them or borrow them. It's up to you. By the way, if you want to make a lot of money, don't plan to write a book to do it. That's not the way it's done. <laughs> but praise the Lord, it is the best way to get them out, I know of. Somebody said, well, why didn't you put this on tapes? Well, it would cost you probably to get the material in the black book. If that had been put on tapes, you'd buy 80 or $90 worth of tapes, depending on how much the tapes cost you. To have the same amount of material you can get for $3. Isn't that better? It's also easier to refer back to a book. Now, if I'd been trying to make money, I would have restricted it to tapes only and copyrighted the tapes and all this sort of thing. But I'm just saying that that this is a textbook, it'll help you. Conquering the Host of Hell has some new things. The testimonies have been encouragements to many, and the third book is already coming together. The testimonies are already coming in from Maine, from California, and of course, naturally, from the Chicago area where we are located. And if you have a t significant t testimony on deliverance, about how God changed your life through deliverance, if you'll write it down, or even better, just put it on a cassette tape and send it to me. I'll put it together. Don't try to get it in any particular order. I'll mess it up anyway when I start putting it together. But I'll be glad to include it if it has some significant truth that will help somebody else get free. One of the blessings in the books has been the testimonies. The second book has even more testimonies than the first book. I think there are 50 maybe in the, sec in the second book. And the testimonies have been used to encourage people across the country and in 14 foreign countries that we know about to seek deliverance because the symptoms that they read about in the books were the same as the person was being tormented with. Isn't that encouraging? Praise the Lord. Praise God. And since the devil works the same everywhere, well, 
the symptoms are going to be the same. Demons do and say the same thing everywhere. Somebody asked me to be especially sure to bind spirits over the camp before we begin this meeting. And that's probably a good idea because I plan to stir the devil's nest a bit today. And so let's just bow our heads for just a moment. Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come against you in the authority and power of the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. I am seated in the heavenlies. In Christ Jesus, high above principalities and powers, high above, above Satan himself, high above every dominion and power that rules and reigns in this wicked world. And I come against every wicked spirit that would be here to confuse, to distract, to disturb, every spirit of pain or sickness that might dis uh, cause somebody to be distracted from the truth they need to hear today. I bind you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And by binding, I mean that you're not to harass, you're not to torment, you're not to drive anyone in this building. In the name of Jesus Christ, I so order it to be done. And Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to loose the spirits of truth, to loose the spirits of understanding, to loose the spirits of wisdom, to loose all the spirits of God that will help your people to come free and to receive the glorious truth of freedom in Christ Jesus, that they may praise Him, that they may honor Him in a way they have never been able to do since they were born again. And for this we will give you thanks and praise. And Lord, would you move in mighty power to destroy and disrupt the work of the enemy Wherever he's built up a wall, we claim the power of God to destroy it. In Jesus' name. I believe it might be wise at this point to do what we call clear the underbrush. Now, in deliverance, we have found that the reason most people who desire to speak in tongues, for example, but cannot... The reason is there's an occult root that's hidden somewhere that has to be ferreted out. We've had amazing success in people receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit at our little church. Now this doesn't reflect any credit on us. Many of them had been many places and been prayed for many people. But the thing that had never been done for these people, they had never been led to renounce the occult and to forgive the people who had hurt and disappointed them. And these two areas will block a complete moving of the Holy Spirit upon a person. Notice I said a complete. It will block complete healing. It will block complete deliverance. And in some cases it's strong enough to block any of it. It just depends on how strong the bondage may be. Now I'm not going to, I could go into a discussion of how a Christian gains, uh, can have a demon. Uh, it's spelled out in Scripture. People say, show me a Scripture that says a Christian can have, have a demon. My first answer is, show me one that says they can't. Because there isn't any. However, there are Scriptures that definitely indicate it. Galatians is the strongest one. If you have received any spirit other than the spirit that you received when we were there, Paul says... I don't know how much plainer you have to be. He's talking to believers. He's not talking to a bunch of heathen out in the uh, worshiping out in the temple somewhere. He's talking to people who have been saved. He said, if you receive another gospel, if you receive another Jesus, if you receive another spirit which you have not received. And we talked about the spirits of God and the spirits of the evil one yesterday. Now, there is a curse that comes on those who dabble with the occult. There also is a great blockage in the area of forgiveness. Now, Jesus taught us to pray, Forgive us our trespasses as, or with the same measure, that we forgive those who trespass against us. That's the model prayer. That's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in the 17th chapter of John. But the model prayer in which he gave us all the elements of correct praying and I don't know that it's any particular value to repeat it word for word, although I guess it's all right, but that's mainly to give us all the elements of it. You can expand on it. But we pass over lightly, forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us, and we just scoot over just about like that. And it means just about that much to us. And every one of us have been hurt 
and disappointed by those that we loved and trusted through our lives from the time we were children. For instance, some of you came up in a home and uh, maybe your parents were very poor. Somebody said God must have loved poor folks. He made so many of them. But a lot of people are not wealthy in this world's goods. And maybe you can remember, you came dashing into the house one time when you were a little girl, something of this order. Mama, can I have a new dress? Susie down the street got a new dress. And I want a new dress too. And poor Mama was trying to figure out how in the world she could make the little dab of food they had stretched till Dad's next payday and he was being laid off and didn't know where the next house payment was coming from and blown two tires on the car and they had all kinds of problems pressing on them and Mama snapped at her and said, No, child, don't be silly. And you went off and you were hurt. Now that you grew up, you understand that, but you didn't understand it at the time and that hurt was there. You see, we need to teach even children to forgive so these things don't build up because they're cumulative. They build up. And hurts and disappointments through life build up. Mothers and dads disappoint and hurt their children. Sometimes they can't help it. Sometimes they can. Grandparents and relatives are often close enough to you to hurt you or disappoint you. Preachers and teachers do a good job of it sometimes. They can really wound somebody deep. Boy, husbands and wives are experts. And children can just tear the heart out of a parent. And of course what you do, you just simply say, well, you know, uh, well, I've gotten over that. You know, that's what you say. But every time you think about it, it hurts. And the very fact that you hurt when you remember it indicates there's an open raw sore there that's hurting. And it has not been healed. The bitterness has taken root. And roots of bitterness pollute and disturb what God wants to do in your life. Now Jesus didn't just say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and give that to us as a model prayer just to be nice and religious. It's an absolute essential because the spirits that cause cancer and the spirits that cause arthritis are both rooted in bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment that comes out of those experiences in life. Now immediately when I say that, some people kind of look at me in horror and say, Whoa, back up. My mama was the sweetest person on earth. Lovely person. and She died with cancer. Don't you tell me she had evil spirits. Well, now you don't think God made that cancer, do you? And the reason... You say, well, old oh, brother so-and-so, he is the nicest fellow ever was, always doing something for somebody. He died all crippled up with arthritis. That's right. You're right on target. Because the people who are gentle and are sweet and giving of themselves are the ones who get hurt the most. And they seldom talk about it to anybody else or to God. They just kind of grin and bear it. And it provides the soil out of which those terrible spirits grow. Now I've got everybody's attention. Because nobody wants arthritis or cancer. This is one way to make you really get interested in doing what the Lord says. You know, this is known as motivation. Amen. Don't you feel motivated to find out about forgiveness now? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, but seriously, there are other things I'm sure that are rooted in these things too, but these two in particular we've found over and over again are rooted into this. Now remember this, demons root in only one place in you. That's in the old sin nature. In 1 John it's quite explicit that that new man has no, no dealings with the evil. But when you got saved, you became a split personality. You have the old sin nature and the old body you always lived in, but a new nature from God slipped in alongside of there. And I know these people cry with holy horror, How could a demon dwell in a place where the Holy Spirit is? And that sounds so religious it convinces a lot of people. Well, let me ask you this. How do you think the Holy Spirit can stand to live alongside that old sin nature? You think that's any petunia patch? 
The old sin nature is as rotten as any demon that ever was hatched. He said, oh, I've got mine sanctified out. Is that so? I'd like to talk to your wife. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let's don't be hypocritical. We're to crucify the old nature. Paul, toward the end of his life, said, I have not yet attained, but I press toward the mark. Brother, sister, if Paul hadn't attained, I don't, I'm not too impressed with these little Pauls running around. <laughs> They're not doing what Paul did, and he hadn't attained. And like I tell demons sometimes, they manifest and they'll say, My name is Lucifer, or my name is Satan. And I said, Is that so? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If the big boy showed up, I'd expect balls of fire to come out of the ceiling at least. You know, I'd expect something more than just a little dab like that. Besides that, I said, do you think I'm so stupid and so prideful that I would think Satan would take off from his business of running his universe, his wicked universe, to come down and fool with a peanut like me when he's got princes and everybody else who can uh, do war with me? That's the height of pride. Say, Satan appeared to me, baloney, probably a minor demon. You didn't know the difference because he said so. <laughs> I found people that got all puffed up, thought they met Satan face to face. Well, you probably met one of his small bulldogs. <laughs> Maybe a chihuahua and you thought it was the big boy. I don't know. <laughs> but seriously, we need to understand that God wants to set us free. The old sin nature, the remedy is to crucify it with Christ. Bible study, prayer, in the understanding and in the spirit. Songs, hymns, spiritual songs, fellowship with other believers, hearing the Word of God, prophecy, revelation, all the genuine flowing of the Holy Spirit will strengthen that inner man, and everything that strengthens the inner man will crucify the old nature. You won't have to stop and think if it's being done or not. If you're strengthening the new man, he's busy putting the old one down. But I'll guarantee you, if a demon has gained a foothold in your body, mind, or spirit, and he can lodge anywhere in those, you'll not get him out because he will not crucify. And you can square things with God, but it won't be squared with him. He'll say, that's just tough about that. that take, that's taken care of, but that doesn't affect me. Because, you see, the remedy for dealing with demons is to kick them out in Jesus' name. Now, what we have today in the fundamental Bible-believing groups, whether they're charismatic or not, they're running around memorizing Scripture, and they're praying, and they're doing, boy, I mean, they're doing battle with the devil, they think. They're just fighting flesh mainly, but I mean, you know, they, they think that's what they're doing. And this never-ending battle goes on because they are trying to use the remedy for crucifying the flesh on the demons, and it won't work. See, there's two problems. The old nature, that's to be dealt with by crucifixion with Christ. And it'll work real fine. But if a demon's there, he just still rares up. Said, you didn't ring my bell. I don't obey that kind of stuff. Oh, he may be irritated, he may be inhibited somewhat, he may be slowed down a little bit, but he's not stopped by any means, and he certainly doesn't come out because of that. But the remedy for him is kick him out in Jesus' name. One remedy, you can't kick the old sin nature out. Neither can you crucify the demon. Use the remedy that God designed for each one. Now, in forgiveness, you must forgive. It's not optional. Let me stress that. This is not something you can pick and choose and say, well, I want to be nice, so I'm going to forgive, or I feel kind of stinking, so I'm not going to do that. I mean, if you want to be square with God, it's absolutely essential. <laughs> By the way, when you're dealing with demons, we only recently learned this from Norman Parrish, who came in from Guatemala. Not only break curses when you're dealing in deliverance, but also break all legal holes and all legal grounds. There are some things that are not technically curses, but they offer footwork for the demons, and you can destroy those with the blood. The other thing that is a real source of bondage, an extremely dangerous area, is that of the occult. Now, let me mention some things that are occult. First of all, let me say 
that the occult carries a curse to the third and fourth generation from God. That's from God. Now, that's not from the devil. The devil might not be able to carry out all his stuff, but I, God's quite capable, wouldn't you say? Now, this is so serious. The devil has drawn a blank across it and kept it from being preached in the churches for many, many years. It's there. It's spelled out carefully. In Exodus, the 20th chapter, 3rd through the 5th verses, you'll find a curse pronounced on those who have other gods to the 3rd and 4th generation. What most people don't realize is, they never stop to analyze it, there are only two sources of supernatural knowledge in the world. One is the Word of God, enlightened and taught by the Holy Spirit of God, and if you don't get your supernatural knowledge that, through that channel, the only other channel it can come through is through Satan. And he does this by means of the occult. And every genuine thing that God has or that God is doing in the spirit realm has a counterfeit demonic activity operating by Satan. Every one of the gifts is counterfeited by Satan. And the mere existence of the counterfeit just proves there's a reality. The fact that there are false tongues is simply proof that there is a real thing that Satan is trying to counterfeit. By the way, a counterfeit, the definition is a cheap imitation of the real thing. And boy, the devil's imitations are really cheap. We, uh, when we were in Guatemala, we bought a, a ring, which we thought was turquoise, and set in sterling silver for my daughter and she was very proud of it and when I got ready to come down here she said Dad the little piece has come out of my ring and I'm afraid I'm going to lose the stone out of it so would you take it to that man in Arkansas and see if he can fix it because she really treasures that ring because we brought it back far from Guatemala so I brought it to Jay and he ruined it he was going to sort it or something and he said it turned black because it was made out of iron <laughs> And he said the stone was plastic. <laughs> well, you know, that's the way the devil's things are. They kind of look good if you don't know much about it. And when Jay looked at it, he said, when? He said, that's not a turquoise stone. I said, it's not. I said, no, that's plastic. I said, well, that's funny. It looked like turquoise to me. Of course, that's the way they fixed it. They intended for that to what it looked like, you know. But that's the way the devil's things are. See, they, they look like the real thing unless you know much about it, unless you put them to the test. If you put it to the test of fire, it'll, it'll show up for what it is, a counterfeit. Now, let me mention this. You do not have to sleep in bed with somebody who has smallpox to get the disease. All you have to do is walk in and touch the sheets. Do you see what I'm saying? Because a lot of people will say, well, you know, yeah, I did dabble with that once when I was a kid, but, you know, I never, eh, I just dropped it. Or it never did work for me, and I just walked away from it and forgot about it. Or maybe I was involved in all that stuff, but when I got saved, boy, I put all that stuff away. And they think that's all right. Well, it's good you put it away, but there's some things you didn't put away. It's still there. Now, Satan is a legal expert. When you or somebody else opens the door who has authority... The demons will flock in if you give them an open door. We dealt with a woman, and this terrible occult spirit was in her. It was a fortune-telling spirit. And yet, I don't think the woman had been to fortune-teller necessarily. And I asked that thing, I said, when did you come in? And he said, when, you, when she was three years old. And I said, oh, come on. Let's don't play fun and games. You know, a three-year-old child wouldn't go to a fortune teller. He reared up, he looked at me and said, Well, shut your mouth, Worley, I'm telling the truth. Well, that's refreshing, you know, for one of them to tell the truth. But uh, they usually lie. But he said, uh, Why should I lie about it? said, Her father took her to a fortune teller with him. And said, He was her authority. You know that, Worley. Boy, a cold chill went over me because that's true. Her daddy was an unsaved man, took her with him when he went to a fortune teller, and that evil spirit got into a three-year-old child because her daddy uncovered her. 
Are you listening to me, Dad? Amen. Amen. You better learn how to get in the spiritual saddle. Because all this stuff you're going to be accountable for before God. He was her covering, and boy, her umbrella had holes in it. And that woman was tormented all her life long by that vile spirit till she got delivered from that thing, came in when she was three years old. Now that child was exposed. When you get exposed to these things, they'll take. Derek Prince said, and I think he's right, the devil is no gentleman. He will come in at the slightest opportunity, and he has to be kicked out in Jesus' name. He will not leave voluntarily. All right, let me mention some things in the occult. If you've ever touched these things, or if they've been in your family, chances are you're wide open for occult spirits. By the way, these things travel in bunches. They don't like to go solo. They, the more the merrier is their cry. And they'll want to lead you to the other one, too. If you notice that, people get dabbling with this, and then they go to that, and then they go to the other. Just leads you a little deeper. The, occult, the Ouija board. Boy, how many people has that put under occult subjection? And we're down here in the good old Southland. Water witching. If I had a well, I didn't know whether it was witched for or not. I'd sure pray over it before I drank any more water out of it. You say, oh, preacher. I would. So it hadn't hurt me yet. Well, maybe. Don't take any chances of these things. They're too dangerous. Won't take you but a minute to pray. Knowing it with all, and de dedicate that well to Jesus Christ. Command any spirits in there to leave. You've got authority. Use it. Sorcery of any kind. Automatic writing, handwriting analysis. Fortune telling of any kind. That's tea leaves. That's crystal balls. That's... Um, Palm reading, card laying, tarot, all the rest of that. Horoscopes and astrology. Did you ever read your horoscope in the newspaper just for fun? To laugh at how silly it is? It's not, it's not a laughing matter. It's dangerous as all get out. If you've read them for fun, if I were you, I'd include it in my list. I think I'd put them in. You see, the devil has been so sly, he's gotten into things. You say, well, that sounds so silly and so picky. I'd rather renounce something that wasn't there than to miss one that was. Amen. It's not going to hurt you to renounce it, but it sure will hurt you if you, if you overlook it. Witchcraft of any kind, white, gray, or black. Hypnosis under any pretense or reason, medical or whatever. Acupuncture. That's the old Chinese witch doctor's method. ESP? That's scientific, you say. It sure is. It'll get you into more hot water than you can get out of. Without You'll never get out of it without Jesus. Levitation. Did you ever go someplace where they're lifting people with their fingers, you know? Isn't that fun? Didn't you ever wonder why it worked? You say, well, I didn't do it. I was in the room where it happened. I'd include it if I was you. Because so many times we're so gullible, you know, we open up wide and those things just come rushing in and then they lay low and we don't even know they're there until they start manifesting a few years later. Some of them are laying low in you and won't manifest till you get much older. You know why some preachers go haywire and run off with somebody's wife? Because they've got lust spirits in them that were never dealt with. And the devil waits till they climb up where they can influence a lot of people and then that lust spirit explodes, takes over. And they go off and wreck not only a marriage, but a whole church. Don't you see that deliverance is so essential, it's just not optional, it's got to be? The devil's got his fifth column already in place in the churches to destroy. If they ever start getting off the ground spiritually, the devil will shoot them down from within. He'll have his, the legions explode inside those people who don't even know they've got them. they got like time bombs sitting in there. And the minute that church starts moving, they'll start exploding in the preacher, the deacons, and everybody else that's been living just model lives. Been overcomers, victorious, and then all of a sudden they're the scum of the earth. The devil knows what he's doing. And friend, he's got them stationed in every church. If you don't believe it, when I went to Brother Carroll's church, <laughs> he'd already stirred up a hornet's nest down there before I got there. And I went over there right behind him, with, and I beat on the nest some more. And I told him, I said, Brother Carroll, you're going to have a shelling out here right shortly. I said, there's some of your folks, they're here, but they're not with you. 
I saw him about a month later, heard from him. He said, you was right. He said, there's a bunch of them left already. But I said, they'll come in to fill in, and they did. You see, the church is not strong because of this honeycombing of evil that's inside. And the people who have it don't know it. They're sincere. They have no idea that this, these evil things are in them because they would deal with it. They're not hypocrites. They genuinely want to be used of the Lord. Don't you see? You talk about sly. Hasn't the devil pulled a fast one? And if you were working to destroy the work of God, where would you start? In the churches. And get in the fundamental ones that are believing the Bible because the others are already gone anyhow. They're not giving any trouble anyhow. Just getting those that are alive and blow them apart. Horoscopes, witchcraft of any kind, hypnosis, levitation, clairvoyance. Did you ever see things ahead of time, you know? Thought it was a gift from God? Isn't it funny that you always saw wrecks and sickness and broken necks and broken arms and things like that? Hardly ever see anything good. You know why? Because when you see things ahead like that, the demons arrange it. They tell you it's going to happen, then they run out there and arrange it. And they arrange rotten things a whole lot better than they arrange good things. I, well, I guess they could arrange good things if they want to, but they, they prefer to arrange rotten things. Accidents, sickness, death. They love to arrange those things. And then you say, yeah, that's what Aunt Matilda said. She said that's what was coming. Clairvoyance, renounce it. If it's a gift from God, renouncing it in Jesus' name won't hurt a thing. If it's devilish, it'll, it'll blow it wide apart. Now, I'll tell you something else. Some people don't want to give these things up. Because all kinds of witchcraft is based on power. <laughs> ESP. Why would people want to be ESP? Because they want to dabble in other people's minds. Power. And I've met people who didn't want to give up their ESP, even when they knew it was evil. Mediums, did you ever go to a, a seance? You got them. Charms. Oh, boy. I had my thing laid out to bring to you to show you the old hex designs that are coming into fashion today. One of the new Corningware designs has an old hex symbol on it. It's going into thousands of homes. Beautiful little flowers, and it's a hex sign. Stay with the old blue one. Don't get in that new thing, gals. Because some of them have got hex signs on them. They really have the old Dutch hex signs. And uh, they're putting it in jewelry, too, you know. They even got one in, in Hebrew that goes across there. The new book lists a lot of them. The Ankh, you know. Every once in a while we have somebody come to our church and a lady come down for prayer. And, of course, our people are, are kind of gun-shy, I guess. They, boy, they, they look for jewelry. They look at all the jewelry. They examine everything got around their neck. Boy, they start praying. Because they've learned that you can't break across some of that stuff. Somebody was praying here the other night had a cross on. And they made, made no headway until that cross was taken off. Be careful. The, the Ankh is a cross with a loop on top. It belongs to the old Egyptian fertility goddess. And it's a lust symbol. A lot of Christians wear it thinking it's a Christian cross. Maybe you all just drop crosses out of your vocabulary. It's empty anyhow. I mean, we, you, you don't need those things, do you? I mean, if you've got to wear a cross to prove you are a Christian, there's something wrong, isn't it? Stay with your dove if you want to get something. I mean, not anybody going to think that's a buzzard, are they? Now, if you've got a cross, don't get mad at me. I mean, that's up to you and the Lord. But uh, the devil is really foisting off a lot of foolishness on people today. Yes, he is. Enchantments of any kind. Curses. Fetishes. If you ever dabbled around and dated around with people that were fooling around in witchcraft, you may have picked up a love potion on you. That'll put you so much lust in you, you won't believe. Somebody hits you with a love potion, and what it is is a lust potion. We've broken those things out of I don't know how many people who went out of control sexually because of a love potion that was put on. Now, Edgar Casey, warlock, extraordinary. If you studied the books of Edgar Casey, you got them. Just like dogs got fleas, you got them. No doubt about it. 
you studied his books trying to seek enlightenment, boy, I'll tell you, you'll pick them up. Gene Dixon, witch. She's an extraordinary witch. Well, I mean, you know, you're a Christian. Most of you, I presume, are Christians here, if not all of you. Uh, you know a little bit about the Bible, you'd say. If a snake crawled in bed with you and wrapped around you and then gazed into your eyes and said, look to the east for your knowledge, would you think that was God talking to you? <laughs> she did. <laughs> would you go to a crystal ball and cards to get your information? She does. She doesn't know the Lord from a lizard. She goes to church every day, but she doesn't know the Lord. She's a witch. And if you've studied her books, a lot of people study. You know, a lot of people, they're, they're, they're starving. They're trying to find out something. Before they find the Bible and the Word of God, they'll grasp into this stuff. And that's how you pick up the spirits, digging in that. Just like digging, well, it's just like digging in a manure pile. You're going to get some of it on you. Just because you walked away from the manure pile, everybody that comes close to you, they say, what's wrong with you? You've got something on you that doesn't smell very good, you know? It doesn't smell like perfume. Eastern religions. A lot of people go off into Eastern religions. Transcendental meditation. Boy, that's the open, that's the super highway for mind control to grab hold. And right close behind it, running a close second to get mind control, is karate. The power behind karate is strictly demons. You say, oh, what do you think I got this split across my eye up here? Karate chop from a Moody Bible Institute preacher who had just come back from a missionary tour in Germany. He came up to me and he said, Pastor Worley, he said, you know, I got tangled up in karate. Before I found out what was wrong with it, I think I better get rid of it. I said, all right, son, sit down here. And so we started talking and it was very ugly. It cussed me out and used some expressions I won't repeat. And uh, they weren't complimentary. And uh, they, um, uh, so finally he ripped the hand loose and he chopped me across the eye here. And it laid this eye open about three or four inches like that. And blood came down on my head, and I was kind of stunned, but I just moved back. The work, he didn't get any help out of it. The workers just moved in on him. Like a bunch of bulldogs, they just moved right in. Kept him. He didn't get a, even a minute's rest, but he got the satisfaction of whopping me over the eye, you know. And one of the boys said, oh, it's going to take three or four stitches to close that eye. He's just sick about it, you know. But I got a Polish Catholic man, used to be a Catholic, and uh, he's one of our elders, and he... Uh, he felt about the size of Glenn here, you know, about big as washing the soap. And uh, he he jumped up there, and and he was just real angry because that thing had hit his pastor. And so he said, no, he's not. That boy said he's going to have to take stitches to close that eye. No, he's not, Wynn. Sit down over here. Well, I mean, he took that tone. I mean, I sat down, you know, on the platform. He sat down beside me, and he was, oh, he was angry. He was just so mad, and he said... Now, blood, you stop in Jesus' name. And boy, it just went, and it just, it, I think it stopped halfway down my face even. And then he said, and he took the eye, and he just, it was all hanging open, you know, and he pushed it together, and he said, now you stay, and you stick, you stick, you stay right there, and you heal right now, in Jesus' name. Now, I don't know whether that's orthodox or not, but that's what he did. And you know something? It stuck. And he said, now everybody that pain in his head, you leave right now. And it just went Phew, like a bird going off my head. And he turned to me and said, now go wash your face, Wynn. <laughs> and very obediently, I got up and went back to the washroom. And, well, I mean, you know, I'm just sitting there and, and I washed my face. I came back and just had a little red line. Did you know that eye, that it was never bruised, it was never sore, it never bled another drop? I could push around on it and it wouldn't even come apart. And, of course, being having a little bit of a teeny weeny mean streak in me, I walked back over to that demon. And I said, how do you like my eye? And he screamed at me and cussed and said, I meant to knock your head off. I said, well, you just don't get to do everything you want to, do you? And, you know, the, the instant healing of that eye convinced a lot of people that were visiting it like they they were like this. 
our people are praising the Lord, of course, but some of the visitors, I, they, they couldn't hardly handle it. You say, well, why did he hit you? Well, one thing, so God could heal it on the spot and just show people how powerful he is. Well, I've been pitched across the church, been bitten and everything else. And they, but I'm in pretty good shape. It is, I mean, you know, the Lord can fix anything the devil unfixes. And after all, soldiers get in a scrap, they lie with a scratch now and then. Nothing serious. Nothing permanent, of course. So karate is definitely that. Yoga. Don't even do the exercises, people. There's something about the yoga exercise that opens you up to demon power. I don't understand it, but those contortions of the body open you up to the demons. Now, I know this is true. We've talked to too many spirits. One time there was a girl sitting on the front pew, and I walked over to her. She'd come up for deliverance. And uh, I asked the kids, I said, what, what's she got? I said, well, she's been into yoga. I said, well, we'll just start with that. I said, okay, yoga. And she jumped right straight up and ended up on that seat in a lotus position. Now, I don't know how she did. We, like, never got her legs unlocked. I mean, she jumped just right off the seat. I mean, I've seen them do some real weird things. That lotus position, by the way, is a perfect triangle, you know? makes a triangle out of your body. You sit that way in karate, too. A black belt who came and got delivered over in California told me, he said, Pastor, I said, you're right about that lotus position. He said, that opens you up and your sex organs. And he said, I could feel the demons rush into me when we were going into the meditation sessions in karate. He said, I'd be so steamed up sexually after I went through one of those things, I'd go looking for somebody. And they're teaching gals this for natural childbirth. They're teaching it in physical education classes to sit in the lotus position. And that is opening them up for demons. By the way, a lady who came to our church for deliverance, who used to teach mind control, she asked for projects. She could close her eyes and be in the Himalayas or Europe or wherever she wanted to go. All she had to do was close her eyes and she was there. She's good at it. Of course, she renounced all that, thank God, and been set free. But she told me, she said, when the way the psychics charge their batteries, when they get tired, they don't necessarily go to sleep. She said, when I used to get tired, I'd take a thumbtack, put it up in a door, top of a doorway, and run a string down each side making a triangle, and then I'd sit in the lotus position underneath it, and tremendous energy would pour through my body until I was all refreshed like I'd been sleeping all night long. And she said, I ran on that kind of energy for many years. And so that's the way the psychics do it. Would you say that the lotus position and the yoga exercises just might be the best thing for you to stay away from? I'm not just crying wolf, friends. I know what I'm talking about. Now, why'd you have to ask me that? <laughs> now, I didn't do this, but some of my bird dogs did back there in Hagwitz. The Star of David, if you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica or any encyclopedia and look it up, you'll find out it's an ancient witchcraft symbol. It's, 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 it's an occult symbol. Well, paint it, paint it over and, and dedicate it to Jesus and oil it good. <laughs> Soft rock, too. In Acts, the seventh chapter, in verse 42, it says, God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. There is no such thing as a star of David in the Bible. It's this star right here. I collared a fellow in Israel in a shop where they were selling these Bibles with so-called stars of David upon him. And I made that man admit that that was a heathen god. And he finally came to it and admitted it. It was not a star of David. But he said it's good for sales. That's Acts, the seventh chapter, verses 42 and 43. I'd have probably found that if I'd looked for it. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Ferris. Uh, you see, the devil has worked 
a real shenanigan to slip up on our blind side, and he slipped all kinds of religious doodads in on us. And if it's a religious, it couldn't be wrong, could it? We have to be careful. We need to re-examine and look for the scriptures. The lady mentioned rock music. That's right down at the bottom of this. It's all occult. The beat, the syncopated beat of rock music comes directly out of voodoo and all the Eastern religions. And anybody who gets involved in it, rock music is made to be felt, not just heard. It's a shattering experience. And our kids are full of demons today because of the rock. Tell you another little interesting thing that might you might not know. Usually on these complicated stereophonic records they're making now, they run about 32 tapes to record the music. Now you you thought, well, good grief! I never sound to me like it's all run together. Well, that's the way it sounds, but uh, you're not demonically selective, you see. And on one of those tracks, nearly all the best known rock groups are open Satan worshippers. Homosexuals, bisexuals, you have whatever you, you name it. They're openly this way. They brag about it. It's even on their albums. And uh, they, well, Kiss, for instance, Satan worshippers, one of the top groups right now. And most of the other leading groups, they're homosexual. They are Satan worshippers, open Satan worshippers. Their covers have witchcraft symbols on them and everything else. Now, on most of these albums that have 32 tracks, on one of those tapes, at the sub-audio level, below the level that you can hear with a natural ear, they have somebody on there who chants over and over again, Satan is king. Worship Satan. Lucifer is great. Lucifer is God. And things of this sort. Satanic chants. Now, when you listen to the record, you can't hear it with your natural ear. But your subconscious picks it up, just like the, sub, the subliminal advertising. Uh, these, um, well, I better not get into that. I better stay closer to this. All right. The subliminal advertising. Oh, boy, that's something else. We're being set up for the Antichrist, people. With TV, with magazines, and everything. Well, just an example. These beautiful waterfalls you see, cool cigarettes. If you look real closely, there's a naked woman taking a shower in that. In that waterfall, she's been airbrushed in. That beautiful nature scene. There's sex written all over the advertisements that we read. Even Ma Bell got into it with a little baby with sex written all over its clothes. They're triggering all kinds of things in us. We don't even know what's going on. You better get your guards up, friend. The enemy has overlooked no way to attack. He's attacking on every front. And he's most effective when we don't know that's what he's doing. I Ching, Hare Krishna, kids who listen to my sweet Lord are full of Hare Krishna spirits. I've never seen one yet that listened very much to that my, my sweet Lord record that doesn't have a Hare Krishna spirit in big as a horse. I'd say, okay, Hare Krishna, come out of there. Leave me alone, Whirly. He's there. Because the uh, my sweet Lord that the Beatles wrote is a, a, a worship song to Hare Krishna, a demon god of India. Tell you another little secret. Most of the incense in this country is made by the Hare Krishna worshippers and is dedicated to him. And you burn it in your house and you get something you didn't expect. You get something besides sweet odor. I'd throw it out if I were you. Get you some spray or something if you want something to smell sweet. I wouldn't burn incense. I've gotten real skittish about it. We used to, every time incense came to our house, our kids got sick. So we realized what was happening. Of course, rock music, mind control, occult spirits all. If you have come in contact with any of these spirits or with other related occult things, there are two steps to getting free. Many people have taken the first step. Well, you've got to forsake it, confess it as sin to the Lord. And many people have done this. But did you know something? If that's as far as you've gone, the devil still has a legal hold on you. In the Bible, they destroyed all the books of magic and things of that sort. They burned it. Don't give it to somebody else. No, he's given a curse to somebody else, is there? You need to confess it and forsake it, but you also must close the door to Satan or else he still has a legal right to come and go through that door. Because you 
or somebody in your family opened that door. Some of you said, well, I never fooled with that stuff. How about your ancestors back four generations? Let's see, that would be grandma, great-grandma, great-great-grandparents. How many of you know anything about your great-great-grandparents? Very few. We don't know what they got messed up in, do we? Seventy-two ancestors involved. I'd have probably figured that out by the way. There's 72 of them. You get, you, there's 72 roads that the devil could have come in to zero in on your life. You think he's overlooked any opportunity? Isn't it better to close those doors? I can show you how. It's not that difficult. First of all, the first step is to confess. So if you've been involved in this, you want to take part, just to be sure, let's go through it. You think about all the things that you've touched in the occult. Okay? Yes, be careful what you buy in a garage sale dedicated to the Lord if you bring it in. There ain't no telling what it's been in. Yes, ma'am. Indian jewelry, be very careful of it. Playing cards, yes. No witch would be without a deck of playing cards because they were originally designed to tell fortunes with. All Indian jewelry made by any Indian tribe has in it, in the design, a design to the court God. Did you hear that? The Indian designs. The only place you're safe is to get it from Jay back here, and he he ain't no Indian, and he he's not going to be designing anything into it that's occult. <laughs> yes, you better watch souvenirs from any place where there are heathen people, heathen craftsmen, Africa or the East. Let me mention this because some people this may be all new to you, and you may think, well, they've just gone completely haywire. Let me take you back to the Old Testament. You remember when they were wandering in the wilderness and they had all the elements to make the temple and the tabernacle and all its furnishings? Remember that? And the Bible said that God gave to certain people skills to weave, to carve and make cunning uh, engravings on gold and silver, precious stones, that God gave them the talent to do this. Now, demon worshiping people very often the craftsmen offer their hands to the demon god and dedicate them to there and they in return are given cunning skills to fashion some of the most beautiful designs you ever saw but it is done by hands that are dedicated to a demon and they are they are doing this as a worship to that god and when you put it in your house the little mexican sun god are the uh the little uh, Buddhas or whatever, you're taking an awful chance. I wouldn't do it. It's just not worth it. Let's put it this way. There may be some innocent ones on the market. I'm not saying they're not. And I don't want to go into a witch hunt and have everybody all scared to death and all this. But if I were you, I'd be very careful what I put in my house. Because you can bring... If you think I'm joking, pick up that book back there, Are Demons for Real? by John uh, Peterson. Uh, Robert Peterson. It's a very excellent book. He's a missionary to Barneo, and read what happened to him when he picked up some curios for his missionary furlough trip. And his son started having nightmares, and they couldn't figure out what was the matter, and it came back to some curios, and how sickness and everything else comes onto a house. When even pictures in Barneo, when somebody gets saved, then the, the people are too poor to have images, so they'll, ha they'll buy pictures of the demon and paste them on their walls. But when a person gets saved, they scrape the pictures off and even wash the glue or the paste off the walls before they're through. It's even dangerous to leave paste on the walls that the pictures are stuck with. Now, that may sound extreme to you, but I'm telling you, this stuff is powerful. It's not just play, play toys. Yes, sir? Well, that eye on the pyramid has nothing to do with God. Neither does the pyramid. That's all wrapped up in the occult and in the Illuminati. Get a hold of Pat Brooks' book, The Return of the Puritans, because all hell's broken loose around that woman and her household since she wrote that book two years ago. She's the lady that wrote out in the name of Jesus. Yes. Is it a double triangle? That may, that may be all it is. Why don't you pray and ask the Lord what to do about it? And the Lord, the Lord can tell his people what to do. Uh, some of these things you can't get rid of because they belong to somebody else. Anoint them with oil and dedicate them to Jesus and curse the demon in them. Yeah. Frogs and owls are things of the night. Be careful. Pray about it. 
But isn't it strange that frogs and owls have become so prominent with the occult revolution? They're on everything. This lady over here has had her hand up for a while. Excuse me. It was called a Mary, what was called a Mary spirit. And uh, when that was uh, called out, it was just like my mind was in a vice, my head. I, you know, I thought up until that time it was kind of foolish that people didn't really have to scream when these things came out. But I had absolutely no control over my screaming. And it was just like my head was just like in a vice. And I grabbed my head, uh, you know, with my two hands, and I just screamed and screamed and screamed. And so uh, I'm sure... <laughs> I mean, I had something there, <laughs> and uh, I don't know where it fits in with the, all this uh, cult and all that, but... Well, Mariolatry is definitely a spirit. It's one of the most obscene spirits I've ever dealt with in my life. The filthiest things I've ever heard said by demons have come out of the spirit of Mariolatry. Cursed us out and said, bow down and worship me, you blankety-blank clogs of dirt. I'm the mother of God. And uh, it's always a very obscene spirit. And... Uh, what more can I say? It's a spirit, that's all. Yes. I, I don't class that as magic myself. To me, it's just dexterity of the hands. In my thinking, now, you ask me my opinion. Uh, magic has to do with more than that. Magic is really making something happen that shouldn't. Return to the owls. All right. The owls are creatures of the night and frogs. Frank and Ida Mae Hammonds have warned against those in their book, Pigs in the Parlor. I think we'd be well advised to heed their admonition to be careful. I think you could get along without owls and frogs in your house. Cats, uh, cats are often used by witches as familiars. And some people have an uneasy feeling about cats. I guess that would be a matter of personal preference. I don't know. I don't know of any specific f prohibitions about them, but they, yeah, they worship the cat. Mm -hmm. Well, cats are often used. Cats are peculiar creatures, and uh, they, uh, of course, dogs aren't spoken of too highly either. So now we got all the animal lovers on the warpath. People didn't tell us about the owls. What's behind the owls? Well, the the owls. Um, now I've 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 heard you know, I've I've heard this story and I can't confirm this. I have reason to wonder about my source, Glenn, the reason I hesitate a little bit. Uh but let's just need needless to say that I mean that man's been discredited and so I would rather wait until I check it from another source before I use it. Uh the owl and the frog are often involved in creatures of the night. There are reasons why God calls certain animals and birds unclean. It may well be because they are most easily inhabited by demon spirits. Now, do you notice I say it may well be? I can't say for sure. I haven't dissected them to find them. But I know there's a reason why God made certain animals and birds unclean. So you can now send you to your Bible to see which ones that is and how come. But there, there is always a reason for what God says. All right. Now, let's move back and let's renounce this stuff and let's get it out, okay? First, we're going to confess it as sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the first step to getting things right is always to get things right with God, to be sure that it's under the blood, to be sure it's been confessed to the Lord as sin. And any occult contact or anything you suspect you may have contacted should be put under the blood by confession. So if you'd just bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, I come to you and I confess that in the past, through ignorance, through curiosity, and sometimes through stubborn willfulness, I have come in contact with certain occult things. I now recognize this as to being sin, and I do repent, and I confess it as sin, and claim forgiveness. In particular, 
I confess contact with the following occult things. Now, you mention to the Lord the things that you can remember from a child on up that you have come in contact with. In connection with levitation, don't forget table tipping. I do confess all these things as sin. And claim your forgiveness, Lord. I also claim forgiveness for any other occult contacts that I do not know about. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now then we're going to do the second step, which is just as critical, to close the door to Satan. We're going to address Satan, and you never go against him unprotected. Repeat after me, please. Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And I'm closing any door that I may have opened to you through contact with the following occult things. Now you tell Satan again all the things you just mentioned to the Lord for forgiveness. And if you think of an extra one, put it in. I renounce all the things I know about and the things I don't know about in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, there's a couple more things that need to be covered. Just repeat after me, please. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now renounce, break and loose myself from all demonic subjection to my mother, father, grandparents, or any other human beings, living or dead, that has ever been in the past or is now dominating me or controlling me in any way contrary to the will of God. I thank you, Lord, for setting me free. I also repent and ask you to forgive me if I have ever dominated or controlled anyone the wrong way. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now renounce, break and loose myself from all and all our children, from all psychic heredity, Demonic holes, psychic powers, bondages, bonds of physical or mental illness, or curses upon me or my family line as a result of sins, transgressions, iniquities, Occult or psychic involvements of myself, my parents, or any of my ancestors, of my spouse, any and all ex-spouses, or their parents, or any of their ancestors. I thank you, Lord, for setting me free. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now rebuke, break and loose myself and all my children from any and all evil curses, charms, vexes, hexes, spells, 
jinxes, jinxes. psychic powers, powers. bewitchments, Witch. witchcraft, witchcraft. Or, sorcery, or sorcery that have been put upon me, been put upon me. or my family line, or my family line. By, any person, by any person or persons or persons. from some occult source or occult or psychic source, and I command all connected and related spirits to leave me. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Now, as strange as that may seem to you, if it's new, legally, you have just severed connections with many legal holes and legal bonds. It does not necessarily take this enemy out, but now he has no ground to stand on and he stands exposed and open to attack. A curse or any legal hole stands like a fence to protect his position. And this is why I wanted to take you through this, because if you've never been through it, now you are freer than you have been before. Legally, the devil hadn't got a leg to stand on. Now don't open the door anymore. Now, Brother Glenn suggested there might be uh, someone ask questions, and so if Brother Carroll will come and Brother Ferris will let you fire at us. And uh, I know most everything, but what I don't know, they do. Come on, fellas. <laughs> Now, seriously, we'd be glad to try to field your questions the best we know how. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I want to a question. It's something I didn't hear you mention. Huh? <laughs> 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 yeah. But um, I don't know if many parents are aware of it, but we have, we have had to deal with, deal with some young people in the areas of, of deliverance to play, um, play a game in school, particularly, called Mary Word. I don't like any of the That's what called. Mary Word. Private school or not? No, no, it's public school. Public school and public school, both places. Yeah. They, they, they play this game. Tell them briefly how it works, John. One, one, one variation of it is that the kids go into a bathroom and look into the mirror and call on Mary Word. And she appears. And she appears. Now, this one particular lady. Um, who, who has brought our fellowship to ministry, she did not use the name Mary Worth, she used the name Jamie. And she called on Jamie. And it was when, when she was in about fourth grade that, uh, that, it, that this, this spirit entered into her. And from that time she had strong suicidal tendencies. When she came just to hand and was all cut up with knives at her, where she had attempt, attempted just, just to cut her vein, and she had attempted to kill her <coughs> too. And well, um, her mother had just learned about deliverance and, and, and brought it to us and we ministered to her. And, and that day she was beautiful, beautifully delivered, received the baptism in the Spirit. But the thing is that many parents who are not aware of the games that the kids play, be it if they go to some church somewhere, you know, they play it in church or they play it in school. And I think you ought to be fully aware of these things. And this is just one example of one of the things that's very, very dangerous. Yes. Thank you, John. And another thing that I might ought to mention, if you parents are not aware of it, at the slumber parties and things of this sort, many times they play levitation and seance, too. Somebody have a question or another comment, maybe? Uh, uh, brother, uh, hey, uh, well, the uh, demon is cast out, and, and your house is swept clean. You see, you see what I'm getting at? He goes back and says, oh, this house is swept clean. But as the demon goes out, there's a vacuum there. What? Brother Worley probably would have thought of this. Okay, number one, believe and do what God's Word says. That's Mark 11, 22 through 26. When you come to the word mountain in the Scriptures, you always equate that word. Now, this is just a thought. You always equate that with governments. Satan has kingdoms. He has a government. He has a plan and a purpose, and the whole thing ends up in death. He means business. So when the word says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, 
The sea and the bottomless pit are equated in the Scriptures. You shall not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say shall come to pass, you, it'll come to pass. You'll have what you say. The mountains are the principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. All right, now, that's number one. Number two, submit yourself to God. James 4, 7, and 1 Peter 5, 6. Number three, resist the devil. That's James 4, 7. Four, worship the Lord in the Spirit every day. That's important. Don't wait to come to the church and the congregation, you know, just to speak in tongues and praise God. Praise the Lord before you ever get out of bed. Amen. Speak in the Spirit. Amen. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. Amen. Glory to God. Worship the Lord in Spirit. That's John 4, 24. The Lord is seeking such to worship Him. All right? Now, number five, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 5 through 18. God has made provisions for that in, the, in, in 19, 20, and 21. That's verses 19, 20, and 21. He's made provisions by we can speak to ourselves in songs, spiritual songs and hymns, you know, and make, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. The second part of that is to give thanks unto God for all things. And the fourth thing is, is to submit yourself to one another in the fear of the Lord. Six, pray. Well, I've already done that. Praying in the Spirit. <laughs> Number six, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. That's Ephesians five, uh, 6, 11 through 18. Now that's how you can maintain your deliverance. Praise be unto God, because that spirit is, is an earthbound thing. And it goes out and walks around, according to Mac, or Luke, the 11th chapter, it goes out and it walks around into dry places. And then it says, I'm going to go back, and it claims ownership, and it has a right, a legal right, if that house hasn't been filled with God. Hallelujah. More. Yes, amen. Uh, along that same line, uh, we have found that when we're through praying with somebody for deliverance, we turn around and ask the Holy Spirit to fill every area that's been vacated so that there's no vacated place in that person for a demon power to have a right to unless that person then would have to turn around and reopen their self up all over again to have so there would be a right to come back. But if that area is taken over by the Holy Spirit, it now belongs to God, and there's no vacant place there for seven other demons to come back into because it's filled. Hallelujah. There's no place. Another thing that we believe in as much as possible, when there's a deliverance service is over, to have a time of praise and worship that the joy of the Lord will be our portion. And we're there to praise and worship the Lord, that Satan will get no glory Amen. from the show he put on. Yes. Amen. Yes, one, this is... Go ahead, excuse me. One other thing, while well, Brother Glenn is saying, don't forget to pray for the healing, as you pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit, that the Lord will also heal all the places that the demons have left, because they try to tear at places inside the body and uh, the throat and so forth, and pray for the Holy Spirit not only to fill, but to heal and repair the damages that the demons have done, and they're leaving. Amen. Praise be unto God. This, uh, uh, this thought that Brother Glenn just brought out, that in the worship, or in the service itself, after the deliverance has, has become effective and the persons are delivered, I just magnify the fact that we began to praise and worship the Lord and just lift Him up and let, and let the very atmosphere of the, of the whole congregation, or the church and the congregation be filled with the glory of God. It's necessary not only for you, but also for those people that have just been delivered. Listen, they've come through a terrible thing, and they need our help and our assistance and that strength right at that particular time. Bah! <laughs> Halloween, of course, is a, is a celebration of the satanic forces. We should have nothing to do with it whatsoever. And Santa Claus, of course, is a jolly old elf, and you know what an elf is, don't you? Elves and fairies are nothing but the uh, manifestations of demons that have been written down, the leprechauns and all this sort of thing. Those are the People have seen those things. And those are not really for us, are they? Brother Worley, I might make this comment that in school, of course, your kids in public school and this and that, uh, you have a lot of pressure on you from their peer group, you know, to 
participate in these uh, particular events. Uh, Halloween surely is a, a lot of pressure put on you. And uh, in our church, in our fellowship, what we have done, we have an All Saints party. And uh, we call it All Saints party. Well, our people come dressed up like a Bible character. And we've had Moses there, and we've had Samuel there, and John the Baptist. And uh, then we, we make it a real time of worship and glorifying the Lord. And our, our kids uh, enjoy this. And not only our kids, but uh, I enjoy it too, you know. And this is something to glorify the Lord Jesus. Brother Ballard. Brother Worley, uh, although I've worked in deliverance for about eight years, only within the last four months have we really started stressing it in our congregation. Uh, and just before I left, I had a sister call me, and she had been played for several nights, waking up with what she could only describe as being stuck with pins. And she had began praying, and God began to reveal <laughs> that voodoo was being used against her. Uh, my question is, how do we deal with this? Because this is a, an out, this is an attack of Satan from the outside rather than from the inside out. First of all, you get over in the Psalms and you claim the scripture that says you can send a curse back. That those who love cursing, 109th Psalm, isn't it? Uh, you can send a curse and let those that love cursing receive it again unto themselves. Wad that thing up, triple its power, and fasten it on the one that sent them. They need it. I usually, we, we got in a battle with the witchcraft coven up in Chicago. I was trying to send, uh, we had, there was a Satan worshiper coming to the church, a converted Satan worshiper. She'd been into all kinds of stuff. And they kept flinging curses against her. And I got so aggravated with them having to pull those things off of her. So finally, they had imported an idol from India. These Satan worshippers had had it brought over from India and it had a spirit of, what was it? I, I don't even remember what it was. Insanity was bound up in this idol. And they had gathered around this covenant, gathered around. This all came out in the deliverance session. They had pulled that de that demon out of this idol and flung it against this woman, insanity. And she came forward with a splitting headache and uh, said, Would you pray for me? My head is just splitting all during the service. And I said, Why, sure, Lou. And I laid hands on her. And I said, In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every spirit that's causing this. And a deep bass voice came out of her said, Get your blankety blank hands off me, Worley jerked back and then she all, she knocked down three men in the aisle trying to stop her from getting out and they finally got hold of her and brought her back up and we went into a long tussle with that thing and finally we got it bulldog and then uh, he was giving up and he said I give up I'll leave and I said not yet and he looked very frightened and he said what are you up to Worley I said well I have something in mind so I took him through all the confessions I could under I could remember about Jesus was his Lord and a few things like that that humiliated him and rubbed his nose in the dirt real good. And when he was completely broken then and begging to leave, I made him promise to go and attack the coven that had sent him. He didn't want to, but it was the only way he could get away from me, so he decided he would do it. The last I heard, we heard of three members of the coven. One of them was running cross country. The cops were chasing him. One woman got sick, was in bed four days, couldn't get out of bed. And I don't know, because he was very angry with the coven because he said they had put him in there with an ir uh, irrevocable curse. And I said, I've got news for you. I'm revoking that curse. And when it was broken, he was furious with that coven. And so, really, when they're thwarted and doing what they're supposed to, they're very angry. And if you can just wring that thing out and throw it back on the people that sent it, it'll teach them not to send them. I usually ask the Lord to bind it onto them with the blood of Jesus. Because I reason that the only way they can get out from under is to come to the Lord. That'd be great, wouldn't it? I'd just like to uh, <clears throat> speak to this thing on Halloween and Santa Claus, again, according to the Scriptures. Uh, in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, Paul exhorted Timothy before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the, the alive and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word. 
Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss will they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Halloween and Santa Claus are fables. And people like to hear that. Yes, Easter time, all the rest of these things. I believe that we should bring up our children on the Word of God. On the Word of God itself. And teach and preach that. Amen. Don't lie and, to the children. And yes, don't lie to the children. That's a lying spirit that takes effect in that. And also in this very same area that brother, the brother was speaking to about the woman being poked with pens, a few years ago down in Chichi Castananga in Guatemala, I walked into a Catholic church where a witch doctor was practicing right in the front of the church in Chichi Castananga. He happened to be the head witch doctor. I didn't know it. But he happened to be the head witch doctor. He was sitting at a table and he had little corn cob, or not, not corn cob, but corn husk dolls that were made up and they had bits of paper and hair and all kinds of things made up. And he was sticking silver swords through these dolls. I didn't know it at the time, but he was doing that as people had come in. These Indians had paid him to stick these things in there to curse someone else. In Proverbs, the 26th chapter, in the first couple of verses, I think it's the second or third verse, it says, The curse causeless shall not come. There's always a cause for it. Now, it's sin itself where we have missed the mark. Now, I myself thought that I could not be touched by a curse. Now, this was years ago. Now, believe me, I know there's some people sitting right here that feel the same way, perhaps. And then there's others of you that have had your eyes opened up, and you will have them opened up in just a moment. In Proverbs, the 16th chapter, it talks about the fact that pride goes before destruction. You can be puffed up in your knowledge. And the devil likes nothing more than if he can't hold you back to give you a good push and get you out there in presumption until where it gets dominion over the top of you. Now listen, without even asking God, I took those witch doctors on right there. They were pouring whiskey oblations. They were burning hundreds and hundreds of candles right in the aisles. And all at once, I, this man gave some kind of a signal, and all these witch doctors took me on. And I had about a hundred witch doctors that were taking incense cans, and they were and flipping those things around me, and they were speaking some kind of chants and singing in chants as they were whirling these things around my head. And I'm telling you, that smoke and stuff got up my nostrils till I was choking so bad I couldn't breathe. And I'll tell you, they followed me right out of the city of Chichi Castananga. I got on an aircraft. We, we went over to Jerry Owens and Jerry and Sandy Owens where we were staying in Guatemala City. And I got on an aircraft and came back to the States. We got back in. I started feeling sick. And I was rebuking the devil going along there. I started feeling sick. I got up to my home in, when we were living at, at Muncie, Indiana at that particular time. I went to bed and I got up in the morning. And I'll tell you, when I walked past our vanity and I looked in that mirror, I was as green as a sweater. Every bit of me, fingernails, eyeballs, everything. My eyes were green. I was green all over. I mean, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I thought something was wrong with our lighting or something had gone haywire with my eyes. And I said, Audrey, get in here quick. And she come in there, she says, my land, you're green. I said, I know it. I said, what the world do you think it is? I said, and she says, I don't know. And I'll tell you, I began, I, I just got weak. I just got weak as a rag. And I didn't know what was wrong. And I lay down on the bed. And uh, the telephone rang in a little while, and it was a friend of mine, Johnny Isles, from Ciudad, Victoria. He's been a missionary down in, in uh, Old Mexico for years. And he was calling from the Muncie airport. Uh, telling us, he says, come on out and pick us up, Ferris. And I said, well, okay. So I'm, I wanted to get up, you know, and continue to move on in faith. And so here I was, as green as grass and weak as a rag, and I got in that automobile with my wife, and we went out the airport. When John saw me, he, saw, he said, Ferris, what in the world has happened to you? I said, man, John, I don't know. I said, I just woke up this morning and I'm just weak as a rag. He said, Ferris, he said, did you have any witch doctors around you when you were in Guatemala? That's the first thing he asked. I said, well, yes, I did, and I told him what had happened. He says, brother, they've got a curse on you. Why? I says, how could that be? I said, they couldn't put a curse on me. I said, I moved in there in the name of Jesus. He said, brother, he said, they got a curse on you. 
And he began to, well, we went over to the house, and I went back in the bedroom and I lay down, and I could hear him and his wife, or hear my, him and he and my wife out in the hallway pacing up, and John was getting more furious by the minute. I'd called for the elders of the church, and they were on their way up from Indianapolis with a carload of men to come up there and pray. And about the time they got in the yard, John come bursting in through that bedroom door, my wife right behind him. And I'm telling you, they were binding those spirits and binding that curse and casting that thing off of me in the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you, I felt that thing leave my body. I felt it leave my body. And by the time those elders got in the house and laid hands on me and prayed, on, prayed over the top of me right in my bed, I got up by faith and walked out there with them, and God took that curse off of me. You know what else he took off me? Sin. If you call for the elders of the church, God will only raise you up through the prayer of faith, but he'll also forgive you that sin. Amen. He took that sin off me. And the Lord showed me. He said, Ferris, if I would have wanted you to go in there, he said it would have been a different thing. But he says, I am judging those people. And he says, that's Satan's seat. And he says, their judgment isn't yet. He says, you presumed it. It was presumption, brother and sister, that I was in, even though I thought I was doing the right thing. <laughs> Praise God. It says the Spirit ex speaketh expressly that in the latter times, you know any latter times in this? Does anybody? This is the latest hour I know of. In the latter times, it says, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. The word seducing is plano, and it means a spirit that causes you to wander off the path. A wandering spirit. And doctrines of demons. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and, co and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, I truly believe that with all my heart. Just about all the health food nuts that I know are the most unhealthy people I've ever looked at. I went into a health food store out in McAllen, Texas, and this woman asked me, she says, How old do you think I am? And I said, Well, you look about 70. She was really insulted because she was only 40. I've never guessed. <laughs> the master of tact. Right. But I will say this, that I do believe within my heart that we can pray and ask the Lord what foods we should eat and what foods that we shouldn't eat. Praise be unto God. Now, I'll say this to you. I have never had any problem with eating pork over the years. We've eaten a lot of pork. We were on a farm. I was raised on a farm up in Michigan. And we always had our, our pork, and, and we smoked it and, and uh, took care of it, you know, and, and we took care of all those things. But my wife has been unable to eat pork. Every time she eats pork, her body will just swell right up. We quit eating it. We just stopped eating pork altogether. And I'm not telling people to abstain from meat. I'm not at all. But I feel within my own heart that it's only, judge, uh, right, uh, uh, it's only common sense. It's just, it's just a good, sound mind not to eat that kind of thing because it was affecting my wife in a wrong way. Praise be unto God, so we leave it alone. Now, we don't get into a place where we happen to walk in and we happen to walk into Gwen and Irma's house and find them with a great big ham there. I'm not going to make a great big scene out of it and say, Oh, my land, there's the uh, abomination of desolation. Yeah, send it down to McCarroll's trailer, he says. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I know that. But I'm saying you can carry that thing to the extreme of where that you're almost, it's almost as if that it's become the God to you. Yes, amen. Reach over and take somebody by the hand and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Praise God, praise God. Father, we thank you for the sweet fellowship that you've given to us here. Lord, for the many acquaintances that we've made, brothers and sisters in Christ, those that we have renewed, Lord, how sweet it is. Father, we pray as we dismiss at this time until the evening service in just a little while that your hand will rest heavily upon us. Lord, bring those tonight who have needs in their heart, needs that they need to have met, and only you can meet them. Father, I pray that you'll satisfy every hungering heart with the, the, the Word of God, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father, we know there's people who've come to be set free. 
And Lord, we trust that you will set them free this night for the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. This is the end of this message.